Hello, everyone. Um, I am Nancy Taylor. I'm the executive director of the Presbyterian Historical Society. And welcome to this session of PHS Live, which is going to focus on the Journal of Presbyterian History and um, two special issues that are coming out this year about the dynamics of indigenization in global Christian communities. I want to let you know that the session is being recorded and the recording will be available in a couple weeks through the PHS website. We'll have about 45 minutes of discussion and then about 15 minutes of questions at the end. And audience members, you're able to enter questions at any time in the Q&A feature of Zoom. So it's better for us if you use Q&A rather than chat. But I do want to let you know that PHS staff member Gabriela Zoller um, is going to be moder moderating the questions and will help us at the, en at the end with that part of, this, of the Zoom webinar. And Charlene Peacock is also monitoring the stream on Facebook Live for questions. So I am very happy to be joined by um, five folks, four, four folks um, that were very instrumental in um, the kind of genesis and um, coming together of these issues. And I'm going to briefly introduce everyone. Um, first, Dr. Jim Moorhead, who is one of my senior co-editors on the Journal of Presbyterian History. And Jim has actually served as an editor um, of the journal for almost 25 years. He is the Mary McIntosh Bridge Professor of American Church History Emeritus at Princeton Theological Seminary. And he has written widely on the history of 19th and 20th century American Protestantism. So next for the three women who served as guest editors for these issues. Dr. Heather Sharkey is professor in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research is focused on missionary encounters in Egypt and on the history of Muslims, Christians, and Jews in the Middle East. And I will say that when Heather was working on her book on Egypt, she was in our reading room at the Historical Society day after day doing her research, and we really got to know her well. So I remember those days fondly. Um, Dr. Connie Shimo is professor of history at Plattsburgh State University in Plattsburgh, New York. Connie has studied the dynamics of gender and mission in China, and her current project examines American missionaries and medical education for Chinese women in China from the 1870s to 1949. And last but certainly, certainly not least, um, Bonnie Sue Lewis is Professor Emerita at the University of Dubuque Theological Seminary. She co-edited a book called Teaching Mission in a Global Context, and her own research is focused on Native American pastors in the Presbyterian Church. So welcome, everyone. Um, before we start um, specifically talking about the, the special issue, um, Jim is going to provide everyone with a, a brief history of how these came about and how they connect to a change in focus of the journal that happened fairly recently. So Jim. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, uh, as a journal, have historically focused on American Presbyterianism. In fact, uh, there was a period in the history of the journal uh, during which we were called American Presbyterians. Much of this has to do with our institutional locus. We are sponsored by the Presbyterian Church USA. We are uh, also uh, run out of the, uh, let me rephrase that, we have been run out by, that we are operated by the uh, um, Presbyterian Historical Society. So that institutional locus has meant that we have focused uh, for most of our more than 100 years of history uh, on American Presbyterianism. 
But it's important to realize that we're part of a larger tradition and we have at our better moments realized that we're part of a bigger tradition, the reform tradition, that from the time of the Protestant Reformation uh, stretched over a wide uh, swath of the then Christian world. Uh, Reformed Christians uh, uh, in Europe at, at the time of the Reformation went all the way from uh, Hungary over to France and to Scotland. Uh, and that has meant that from the beginning, we, we have been something of a, an international uh, movement. Um, the journal itself, I would say since its inception, has recognized its indebtedness to that larger picture, particularly in Europe. And so from time to time, we've run articles that deal uh, with European, the European origins of, of, of our tradition. And we have also continued to do studies from time to time of other denominations in the United States that have um, uh, roots in the reformed uh, tradition to one degree or, or, or another. And I would say that since uh, the uh, rise of the foreign missionary movement in the 19th century uh, in, in great power in the United States, uh, we have always been interested in uh, what a Presbyterian missionaries have done abroad. So that's given us a much broader focus, even in our more parochial days. Uh, I, I would note, though, that about five or six years ago, we began discussing whether or not uh, we need, uh, needed to have a, an intentionally broader focus if we wanted to convey Presbyterian and Reformed history properly. And the answer we concluded was yes. Uh, in the process, we reconstituted our editorial uh, board who, that advises the, the senior uh, editors uh, to, to be more inclusive of, of the world uh, tradition. And we thought after that was done that one of the things we would like to do is to put together a special issue, perhaps our first uh, major special uh, issue since this reconstitution, in which we look at uh, the reform tradition in a more global context. We then turned to three members of the board, of this broad adv advisory board, uh, the three who, who are with us today, and we said, how would you like to do a special guest uh, editing of, of an issue on this? And that's how we got to uh, the, uh, the current uh, project. I must say, it's been a delight to see how well uh, the, this team has come together. I, uh, someone once said that, if, that faculty members are individualistic academicians uh, uh, bound together by common grievance over parking. Now, one of the delights that we've had is we've seen how these three very strong uh, scholars have been able to merge their interests in a common project. And it's been truly a delight to, uh, to use, I, or to see. I don't think I'll use that joke again because you, you three of you have so totally disproved it. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back to, to, to you, Nancy. Yes, and so um, hearing from the three editors, uh, we learned that they had engage themselves in discussions reflecting somewhat on how this topic of indigenization had impacted their research and their careers. And we thought it would be really interesting for them to share a little bit about that before we turn to the issue um, specifically. So Bonnie, Sue, do you want to start out with that? I'd be glad to again. Thank you, Nancy and, and Jim. Uh, Yes, I am retired uh, as of last September, uh, missiologist professor uh, at uh, University of Dubuque Theological Seminary here in Dubuque, Iowa. And uh, I really, I cut my teeth on, on people like, you know, 
David Bosch, Andrew Walls, Dana Robert, and then Lala Sani, uh, to name only just a few. Um, but my journey into indigenization began really when I started teaching high school in Guatemala in the late 1970s. Um, it's there that I witnessed firsthand, and I'm going to pretend you didn't hear my dog. I've tried to placate her, um, and I'll try again by giving her another bone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but in, in Guatemala in the late 1970s, I witnessed firsthand uh, the political nuances of that term, uh, indigenization, as Presbyterian missionaries there um, were in the process of handing over both power and authority and property to indigenous leaders and leaving the field. And um, I remember the tensions there as these career missionaries sought to be faithful to the gospel and, and supportive of the church leaders that they had trained and, and just trusting the spirit to carry on that work even if it took different shape than their own work. About 20 years later, I was doing doctoral research on Native American clergy, as Nancy has said, the Presbyterian Church, and was engaged with tribal leaders in the church. And, and there I witnessed that part of indigenization that is concerned with theological and uh, devotional practices as Native churches were wrestling and continue to wrestle with reclaiming cultural practices and beliefs that once were opposed by many missionaries and by those within the, the native community who remembered these um, and, and often revered their own missionaries uh, who had taught them. So there were tensions here too, but of a, a little different nature. So I've continued to study, uh, to learn, and of course, uh, was just intrigued with them. Very, very grateful for the opportunity to explore these issues further uh, with such delightful collaborators uh, in these issues of the journal. So thank you. Connie? It always takes a second to unmute. Um, yeah, well, they, um, first of all, thank everybody for coming. And I do want to agree, echo what Bonnie Sue said, how wonderful it's been to work with um, work with everybody. I thought we were a really great group. So indigenization, I think, is at the heart of my scholarship. My first book was on two Chinese women missionary physicians. Um, their names are Kang Chung and Shi Mei Yu. Now, they were, they were Methodist, but it's some of the same you know, issues there. And the issues of indigenization, issues of idea, how, how there's kind of this tension between Idea, an idea of a Christian in brotherhood and sisterhood, but yet right, when you're looking at the late 19th, early 20th century, racial hierarchy is still really important. I have to apologize. I thought people would be, there's people working in my house and I thought they were done actually. I thought even when we sat down, I thought they were done and now I'm hearing them. So I'm, I'm, I have, um, but hopefully it won't be too loud. Um, but, but as far as the Presbyterians go, um, the Presbyterian church was very, very important in my current work of medical missions, uh, medical, medical schools within, for Chinese women within China. Um, and there's what the Hackett Medical College was one of the most important ones, and that was under Presbyterian auspices. Um, and I have recently wrote, wrote an article, I think it came out in 2008 of 2017, in the Journal of East Asia, American East Asian Relations. Um, about, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the noise. <laughs> um, about um, about Mary Fulton, who was a very well known person in the Hackett Medical College. And what I found there was really interesting because officially missionaries had a very difficult time turning power over. But in fact, the Chinese women were basically running the institution until 1915. Um, and, then, and then it became a kind of a contentious thing when new missionaries came. So that's been, again, it's been at the heart of my work and I recently published an article um, and, and I'll talk about the archives later, but things that I got from the, um, from the archives, um, from the Presbyterian Historical Society archives. So thank you. And Heather. Hey, hi everybody. Um, it's great to be here today. I first have to say how much fun it's been working with Bonnie, Sue and Connie on this. And one of the things that Jim didn't say is that we got such an enthusiastic response when we issued the call for papers that we ended up developing two issues out of this. And we could have done more because what's clear is that this is a very vibrant area of scholarship. There's so much happening and there's a lot of enthusiasm. And I think the energy comes through the papers that have appeared in this issue and that will appear in the next one. Um, in terms of the concept of indigenization, um, you know, which means, by the way, a fancy term meaning to make local or make native, 
Um, I encountered it in its political sense, most of all, which is, in fact, when I looked it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, it's this, one of the first dictionary definitions of the term, to make local, to make native, but also to suggest a kind of transfer of power to local people within governance. So I, and the first, the term first appeared, or it was first tracked in 1951, first used by missionaries, among them Presbyterian missionaries in the world, who were using it to describe transfers of power that were starting to occur at a time when the British and French empires were falling apart. And not just falling apart, there were parts of it that were people were ripping apart, and it was in some areas of the world quite violent. In my own work, I encountered the term in Egypt, where in 1956, there was one of the Arab-Israeli wars. And after that, there was a rush on the part of the Egyptian government to force British and French missions out as representatives of the British and French governments. And the American Presbyterians in Egypt at that point found themselves scrambling to do two things, to take charge of British properties when their British colleagues who are ang mostly Anglicans had to leave, and then to figure out how they were going to rush to accelerate transfers of power that had already been occurring, but which they suddenly realized were become, going to become more urgent in this post-World War II period when the Cold War was also beginning. So then there was the concern, the kind of infrastructural administrative concern about how to affect that kind of transfer of power. So for me, in my work, um, indigenization was a political imperative that had consequences for the mission and for local churches. And we see that in other parts of the world as well, where there were similar decolonization processes occurring. And in some places, those ruptures and those transfers had, were more violent and had to occur even more quickly than they did in Egypt. Yes, so in the call for papers for this special issue, um, it specifically referred to um, the late Laman Sané, Sané. Laman Sane, who passed away in January of 2019. And I think the call went out the month or two after that. But um, I, I know all of the guest editors and many other folks in this field um, see him as a very much an influential scholar um, and shaping the way that we have thought about and are, are going forward and looking at this um, this thing we're calling indigenization. And I wonder, Bonnie Sue, um, can you start off by saying just a little bit more about Dr. Sane and his influence? Because you see that in all of these articles and the guest editors talk about that in their introduction to the issue. Yeah, Nancy. Um, Laman Sane, as you said, he was mid 20th century Gambian uh, convert to Christianity. Uh, went on to become one of the leading authorities on indigenization, that whole process, as, as uh, Heather was saying, of indigenizing um, or translating Christianity into the language, the culture, the leadership of local communities. And um, despite the prevailing opinion mid 20th century that Christian mission had destroyed native cultures and imposed you know, Christianity dressed in Western garb on foreign peoples, Sani's lived experience you know, in West Africa convinced him otherwise. Um, and so he's writing in a post-colonial era um, that his book, the classic Translating the Message, uh, The Missionary Impact on Culture uh, was published in 1989. Um, he argued that, that the missionary emphasis on biblical translation had in effect, intended or not, um, uh, of contributing to an affirmation of native cultures uh, and often preserving those very cultures um, and of embedding Christianity in non-Western cultures and even equi of a equipping um, native Christians with agency to shape the gospel uh, in ways that spoke to Native needs. Uh, ultimately, uh, Lansani's influence, along with those such as uh, that I've mentioned, we've mentioned uh, Andrew Walls, 
uh, our own Dana Robert, um, uh, Kwame Biyako, um, many others, but uh, along with them, he helped to lead in this understanding of Christianity that embraces really a plurality of expressions, practices, and theologies, uh, and, and really helped to launch uh, that growing field of which uh, even my, my own title uh, reflects of uh, world Christianity. So indeed, we owe much uh, to Laman Sani uh, as, as a pioneer uh, in this field of indigenization. Heather? Yeah, so to that, I would also add another thing that comes out of his book, Translating the Message, is, is the idea of um, recognizing agency on the part of people who choose Christianity. And therefore, it, and his uh, writings help to enable people to conceive of a shift away from thinking of a Christian Christianity as a one way street from missionaries to people in other places. Uh, and to think of it as Christianity as something that moves in many directions that many people help to build and shape according to their needs. And so it recognized that's also how it ties into what um, Bonnie Sue just said this idea of a world Christianity as a plurality. Um, so that's one of the, the very important takeaways. And I just wanna give also a shout out to some people who may be in the audience from the Yale Edinburgh group on history of missions and world Christianity, which Lamine Sena co-founded with Andrew Walls. And that's become a major forum often through you know, email exchanges or annual conferences to help to develop this field and to bring people together who work on missions um, and on um, world Christianity in different places. So that's another part of his legacy that connects to his scholarship. And I think we can see that reflected as well in these two issues. And Connie? Well, just to echo, um, just to echo what um, Heather sa um, said, I think the idea of giving agency to local Christians, I think is something that, you know, my field is China, so it's, it's a different, it's a different field, but he's had such a profound effect um, on, on how people view this. With a few, if you look, if you basically look at um, Christianity as only being transferred from missionaries to native people, the only thing that native people can either, only they can either be dupes or, or at best, like kind of passive, kind of um, kind of you know, uh, passive recipients, and he really changed the field. Um, he and a few you know, others that have been mentioned before um, really changed the field into looking at how actively, you know, how um, people, uh, people in what we'd call the third world, um, people in you know, in, you know sort of the, the global south, have actually changed, actually shaped and changed Christianity, and that I think. And this wasn't as paid much attention to in 1989, but it's so important now because Christianity is a global religion. Um, in the global South is the prominent, is the place where we see the most growth of Christianity. That, 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 that is, you'd almost argue, the center of Christianity. So I think his work, it was almost, it was very predictive in that way. Um, and very, I think and very important for, um, for, for all, you know, for, for really, really the field of almost any, any geographic location, um, the, um, the, way, the way in which he changed the way missionary, the missionary movement was looked at, I think was really key. Well, we want to turn our attention now to the three specific articles that are in the current spring summer issue, which is out now. And I'm gonna turn over the uh, question and the question part to Jim for this, so. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering what you see uh, individually as uh, uh, and collectively you see as the takeaways from the articles uh, that you have edited into these two fine uh, pieces to issues, uh, particularly uh, the, what has already appeared uh, in the first uh, um, issue. Heather? Well, this is a, a you know your 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 question is challenging because the articles are so rich. So I have the potential, I have the opportunity here to present something about Diana Womack's article called "Lost in Translation: Missionaries in Islamic Garb." And one of the things that she shows is that in this article, by focusing on missionary American missionaries in the Middle East, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Reforms who often work together throughout the region, is that um, Lamine Sana 
the the model of that assumes a transmission of Christianity to non-Christian peoples who became Christian. But the Middle East is a place where most people who joined Protestant churches were Christian already from different backgrounds. And the missionaries also had a lot of encounters with Muslim peoples. This is something we see as well, where missionaries established schools, medical clinics, and so forth. And most people did not convert. So one of the questions she raises is, how do missionaries, how did missionaries relate to um, other Christian peoples and um, to non-Christian peoples, people who remained um, Muslim? And how did they represent them? And what were the disputes over leadership? Now, a few things come out of her article that I would want to flag. One is that the process of indigenization took place over more than a century. We see that in other articles as well, that there were struggles for control and authority within um, small Protestant churches that developed in the area, often while attracting um, Middle Eastern Christian peoples. But one of her major contributions is to study um, the role of the, the, the roles that missionaries played in performing the Middle East for home audiences, for translating the Middle East for supporters of missions back home, often by dressing up in Islamic garb and posing in staged studio photographs, which missionaries then used to raise funds and support. And so one of the things that she questions very provocatively in her article is um, to what extent did missionaries despite their best intentions or their good intentions, end up um, disseminating Orientalist and sometimes Islamophobic attitudes about the Middle East through their presentations. How did missionaries represent Muslim peoples as well as Christian peoples in the region? What are the long-term consequences of that? And how should we be thinking about decolonizing or indigenizing the scholarship to recognize the perspectives respectfully of Middle Eastern peoples on the ground. In terms of methods, one of the really creative things about Deanna's article is her use of photographs, visual evidence. And this is something that has been one of the joys of this special issue and of the next is seeing the creative use of sources. And she uses again, photographic evidence to really great effect to engage in dialogue with this question about indigenization, its implications, and also the social, again, the social responsibility of missionaries and their heirs for representing the Middle East, including Christian and non-Christian peoples. Thank you. Bonnie Sood. I had the privilege of um, helping to edit uh, uh, my friend Arun Jones uh, at Emory uh, University, uh, his wonderful article, um, uh, Refusing to Translate, uh, Ishwari Das and the Indigenization of Western Christianity in 19th Century North India. And um, uh, Arun uses beautifully um, the story of this 19th century uh, uh, Indian pastor living in, in the Punjab area of, of India, um, who um, is able actually to come to the States to study uh, for a year or two um, before his eyesight, I think, is, causes him to have to return. Um, but in, do, in, in so doing, he becomes immersed really in, in uh, 19th century century reformed uh, theology, Presbyterian theology. And, and he takes that back with him and he writes voluminously. And apparently we've got all or most of what he has written uh, in the archives. And so Arun has just uh, immersed himself in Das's um, writings and, uh, and he writes beautifully and, and leaves basically uh, a systematic theology there for his Indian community. And uh, so from that, uh, uh, Arun is able to pull out um, not only a sense of what he's thinking theologically, um, but how he's translating that into the Indian culture itself 
and um, and he does that. Gosh, I am so sorry. I said I wouldn't have the dog here, but I couldn't find anybody the dog sits. So <laughs> she, I'm, I'm feeding her prodigiously here. Anyway, um, uh, the um, the whole idea that um, he takes these reformed concepts um, that he has picked up uh, and studied. And, and then recognizing that he's not living in a Western culture, he's living in a very pluralistic setting here in Northern India, uh, where there are Hindus, um, there are Muslims. And, and so he knows this context well enough that he'll talk about, um, you know, for, for the Hindu, Hindu uh, community or, or, or Christians coming out of the Hindu community, uh, what, um, uh, Arun calls a, a karmic moral economy um, in which he looks at the life of Jesus, uh, the salvific life of Jesus. And, um, and, and he talks about it in, in, in terms of karma. You know, there are, there's good karma and bad karma. You know, your, your deeds are either good or bad. And on top of that, the good deeds, the bad deeds that you may, may do or not do, are translatable. They are, you are able to um, credit them, give them to somebody else, pass them on to somebody else. And so here's Jesus, you know, who, who is, whose good deeds, you know, are, are transferable uh, to uh, those who believe in him. And so, um, you know, and, and voluntary suffering, it's meritorious. And so Jesus has walked to the cross, um, has merit for those who believe in him. Um, and um, so, you know, he, he uses those concepts that would have been familiar to uh, Hindus to talk about Jesus. And, and in the same way for Muslims, um, you know, he uses the Bible in the way that Muslims would use the Quran um, as a guide to both belief and to conduct. And as that source for daily living. So, um, you know, he looks at Solomon. I mean, and he uses the prophet Solomon, uh, common to, to Muslims, revered uh, among Muslims, um, you know, as, it, as an exemplar um, of, you know, of how one um, should live and uh, the injunctions for, for good living, righteous living. Um, so, so these things translate well into a pluralistic setting in which he finds himself. But where I think what we love about Arun and what he did with this article is that he said, but there are things that Das refused to translate. And the things that he refused to translate into culturally um, Indian understanding is the role of women and, and the way that women are treated. And in this case, he felt that in India, women were given no respect. They were not given equal treatment. They were not educated. They were not allowed the many things that, that Das felt women deserved. And biblically speaking, women are spiritually equal to men. So, so what he's hoping here and what he even writes is that, you know, he's not going to allude to anything that might uh, in, in essence, uh, give women an inferior position. Uh, he'll lift up instead how they are equal, you know, Eve taken from the rib of Adam, you know, not the foot, not the head, but, the, the, you know, of an equal nature. He will use um, this with the hope that Indians will see it and then be um, urged to trans form their own culture in ways that give women better treatment and, and, and encourage their education and their well-being. So, so there are things that he will translate and things that he won't. And again, it speaks to the agency that Lamansani, um, uh, that we've spoken of here already, uh, that Christian converts actually had in taking the gospel and sharing it um, and, and translating it into their own cultural settings. Thank you. Connie? So I'm going to have the privilege of speaking of Carl Dolfred, and I hope I'm saying the name right. Um, 
Belfred's article on Thai Christianity in the mid, um, mid 20th century. And what impressed us so much about this article was how the author was able to take one very specific case study and shed light on, um, and shed light on a much broader phenomenon that's important um, in, in, um, in, in almost any study, in any study of indigenous nation. And that, and this goes kind of nicely with what Bonnie Sue was saying earlier, um, somewhat about her experience in Guatemala, that, that, it, that it's, it's hard to, that you might want to translate, you, it might, it, that you might want to transfer power, but it's hard. And so he starts off in this really neat way. He starts off by giving us the official, the official um, version of what happened that was written in the official sources. And basically that's, it made it seem like it was like a peaceful, all love and flowers. He, he puts it more <laughs> elegantly, but just, you know, that they, you know, they, uh, the very peaceful transfer of power um, or just very easy. It just happened almost naturally. The missionaries left and then the, um, and then the Thai Christians took over. And his point is that it was much messier um, and much more difficult. And, and that's really what he, um, and I'd let, I'll let you read the article rather than just, you know, give, you know rather than, um, talk about the specifics he uses, but he, he goes and he proves it very, very well. He shows what a difficult process. Now, in the end, it happened. In the end, the Thai Christians did, um, did assume power and the missionaries did assume a secondary status, but this was really, really hard. Um, and I feel that this is something that it's important in almost anything to kind of look beyond. You might see these like, these, you know, like look beyond what's the official sources. It's something we tell even our first year history students, right? Like, you know, you're not going to, you, you might, you might see the official sources, but then there's a story behind those sources. Um, and in, um, and in, in some ways, I, I really think the, um, that, that okay, it, um, it, it challenges some earlier work because uh, indigenization, because I think if you, I think it's, it, the earlier work was almost argue against the um the idea that you know, again you know missionaries would you know, basically missionaries just came in and walked all over people the native christians basically were dupes and, and so so then that's that that to some extent was arguing against that and then we have and i think all these articles and i definitely think, think in, in the next issue as well people um people saying yes that's true indigenization happened but it's much it's, it's much more complex and difficult and messy um than Lam and Sani may, 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 maybe always indicated. And I think that's that's no that's no disrespect. I think that's almost almost an honor to, to you know when, when you start when you start and you change a field, then people challenge you in return, you know. But that's and that's and that's natural and that's good. I think it's almost the, one of the ways you can respect somebody the most is to say, okay, yeah, I really like what you're saying here, but I'm but I'm actually finding something different here, and I'm going to challenge this. Um, and that's what I like so much about um about this tribute. Um, and but I, I, and I think that anyway, I think that Dolford does, does this really, really well. It's almost kind of the classic, like look beyond. It, it almost, you know, almost it would be. I'm almost thinking of actually of showing this article to some of my actually my my first year history, I mean, my, even students, even who aren't interested in missionaries, because it's, it does such a good job of talking about the um, the, um, the the kind of need to kind of, to kind of keep searching, to keep searching, not not just accept the official version of you know of, of what's going on. So it's it's really an excellent. I mean, all three are really excellent articles. Um, and I hope you're all going to, I think everyone who's going to, who um, reads the article is really going to enjoy them. So thank you. Thank you. Hearing the, the three of you uh, uh, talk, it's, it, it seems apparent uh, that these articles have been cr very creative in the kinds of sources that they have used uh, to shed new uh, light uh, on global uh, aspects of global Christianity. And I wonder if, um, this raises for uh, each of you some uh, un, the, the thought of untapped archival resources that you would like to see used, uh, resources that haven't been, been used. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that you'd uh, like to offer? I would actually, um... Yeah, the Presbyterian Historical Society archives um, in Philadelphia are really a gold mine, and there are other archives that are valuable as well. They actually, these were the first archives that I used as a graduate student. The very first time I went into an archive was with these archives, and it was because I actually, I was actually, my dissertation was actually on my current project, medical missionaries, medical missions in um, in China, or medical education for Chinese women more broadly. Um, and then I narrated to these two particular Chinese women who happened to be Methodist. So I'm actually now returning to some of the treasures I found in the Presbyterian Historical Society archive. Um, but I think that this, when I was thinking about this, how well this connects to what I was saying about the Dolphred article, um, because in many ways, it's um, 
it, it's such that there's such treasure trove and you have you have to look at the that's everything you have to kind of look through but you get some of the if you get some of the official sources there they definitely have them but then you have the letters and i think the letters are especially if you can oh i'm so sorry I, i'm so sorry this is so loud i really thought people were i thought they were done when i started and of course every time i start talking they get louder it's almost like a, like a thing um but um if you, if you look through the um, the letters and a lot of them can be sort of boring and not that you know like, like you're just sort of looking it's like someone else when you're reading someone else's list but then you then all of a sudden you come across like a, a really big controversy um in them and then and then you kind of you kind of get more and, and then you can kind of look um look at them so i think that they they really show the complexity um and the messiness in some ways to use the word that i used before um and the you know, and the kind of difficulty of what what, what happens with indigenization um you know, um, and it shows, and, and there are some things that it doesn't sometimes, and it shows both, like, I think it shows, I think when you're looking at overseas, to some extent, you see missionaries at their best in some ways, but you kind of also see them at their at their worst in some ways. You kind of do in the Presbyterian archives, you, you see sometimes when there's resistance. There's very little overt racism, but there's clear, I, there's, there's clear evidence of people being um, being influenced by, by, by ideologies of race, there, there are, are difficulty, especially when you look at trying difficulty trusting Chinese. Um, and saying some things that would certainly, um, certainly now fit into the definition of what, what, um, what we would almost, almost call racism. But then there's these inspiring examples of, of people working together and doing these amazing things. Um, so they're real, they're really, um, they're, they're, um, they're, they're a fascinating, they're a fascinating source for showing, um, how people who, who put themselves out there and went to a different culture, um, and, and faced the difficulty of that, how they did this. And I actually, since, since I brought up the issue of race, I just kind of like to, to say this missionaries get a rap for being like a lot of almost like blanket oh, missionaries are racist but that's because to some extent missionaries tended to be less racist than the average person um um but they talked about race more because they were talking because they were actually interacting with other people whereas most americans could sort of go on their way at, at this time and didn't have to but they were actually engaging with people so race comes up um, in the missionaries things, but if you look, if you if you kind of look, put it in the, in the, pro the broader context, uh, missionaries tended to be more attuned to ideas of racial equality. I think David Hollinger's recent work kind of really brings this out, um, brings this out well, than your um, than the average um, the average American. But because they were putting themselves out there, they can get the reputation for being racist because they taught them they talked about these issues. But it's just it's a it's a goal it's a it's really um I found the Presbyterian Historical Society archives and, and maybe Heather I think maybe can speak to some other archives as well or maybe Bonnie but I found them just to be a gold mine um I can really speak to the China ones of just fascinating gems that you'd find. So I, I would also to add to what Connie said I would say that one great thing that came out of the articles was the creative use of types of sources. So Deanna Womack using photographic sources extensively in her article. And, um, and to that, I would add that one thing people have not used much are documentary films, many of which archives like the Presbyterian Historical Society are beginning to digitize and make more accessible. I would also add art and paintings that is going to come up as we'll see in the next issue. So using sources that people might think of as more like art history sources. In addition to that, one thing that's great is um, a number of the authors, including Dalfred, used local archives. For example, he used one in Thailand in conjunction with the Presbyterian Historical Society. We'll also see that in the next issue where people used archives in different colleges and repositories. And it's when you bring different kinds of collections together that you often find really rich insights. What I would like to see more of going forward is um, more use of music, including hymns. Some people are starting to do that. Usually a lot of times we've thought about that or I've thought about that as being something that musicologists do. But I think people who define themselves now as more social cultural historians, political historians are beginning to use music sources more actively. And that is an exciting development. And then finally, I would also add museum objects, physical objects. We're going to see that in the next issue too. But for example, um, things like um, so-called ritual objects that museum that missionaries would bring back, and many of them ended up in different museum collections. I think if we can bring together material sources and multimedia or multi-sensory sources, 
I haven't even mentioned textiles yet, the evidence of clothing, we will end up with richer histories overall. Histories which, by the way, may yield more insights into the everyday lives of Christian people, so everyday Christian experiences. And then on top of that, another advantage of using some of these what may seem like more unconventional sources that now that is non-textual sources like songs that were intended to be sung is it might give us more insights into the lives of women and the lives of children and of, of, of various of diverse people, more diverse people than what perhaps more conventional archival written sources can show us. Bonnie Sue, anything you want to add? No, I think I think they've covered it. I mean, there are just a wealth, um, you know, ethno historians, you know, deal with all kinds of things that I think are, are a benefit. Uh, and I think you've named them all. So I'm, I'm aware of the time. I'm not going to add to it. Sounds good. Thank you. So we are basically to our question and answer time, but um, Heather, I'm going to ask you before we do that, can you very briefly, um, you've said a lot alluding to this next issue, which is going to be out at the end of the year. Can you briefly give folks just a very quick sneak preview of the articles in the second issue? Sure. So I think what everybody will see is that th th there's a lot to say about indigenization. I could even see that in the Q&A right now for this about issues that are coming up. One of the things that the articles bring up next time are more questions about the ambiguities of translation and the ambiguities of power. So we will see that with examples from Kimberly Hill on the Congo, uh, Chris White on China, and Richard Fox Young on Hawaii. And also using um, material objects as sources and using creatively using different kinds of sources in Kimberly Hill's study, for example, things like budget ledgers, which show some of the economic pressures behind indigenization. And I think, you know, as we can see again from these articles and from the Q&A coming up, this is a fraught subject, indigenization. It's not an easy one. And part of what it entails is revisiting histories and questioning assumptions, as also, you know, Connie pointed out in commenting on Dalfred's article and Bonnie Sue, you brought this up in discussing the Guatemalan and Native American cases. This is a really fraught issue, an important one, and there's a whole lot more to say about it. And so there are exciting articles to come in the next issue as well, which we hope will contribute fruitfully to these conversations. Okay, you guys ready for some questions from the audience? I think Heather did a great job of alluding to some of these. Um, so I'll start with the first one, um, which is from an anonymous attendee. <laughs> and their question is, what about indigenization here among the US native, pop native population or to the enslaved Africans and even to people who came to Christianity from other religious traditions? Uh, what does it mean for our conversations on racism? That's a big question. Okay, okay. Um, Bonnie Sue, I think, can better speak to the Native, you know, because that, that that that's her that's her area of her area of scholarship. Um, but as for what it, what it, the broad thing about what indigenization means for our, our conversation on racism, um, I would say that it's it certainly, I think, in no way the fact that things were indigenization means that you're kind of letting missionaries off the hook as far as you know kind of racism goes. I, I think that when you study indigenization, you almost I think it's one, but I think it's a more recent, I think it's a way to look actually at how race played in because there's almost always, that's almost always a subtext. I mean, again, missionaries, as I've said before, tended to be less overtly racist than many of the population of whatever time they were, they were in, but they said things that were breathtakingly racist at the same time, like breathtakingly ethnocentric. Like you almost can't look through, if you like look through any, any degree of that at the time, you're going to find some things that are. Um, but I think they give us, I think that looking at indigenization gives us a way to kind of contextualize these. I don't want to take kind of too much time because this is kind of a big kind of area kind of of, of my research about kind of issue, um, issues of race. Um, but I think you, you definitely need to acknowledge how ideologies of race 
are are in the are are in the missionaries community, and it's different in different ways. But I think to take, but I think there's a lot of scholarship that will take because it's it's not hard. To, it's almost like shooting fish in the barrel. It's like to, to to take to find one quote that's again breathtakingly racist and say, okay, this represents all missionaries. But I think what what indigenization does is calls us to explore much more deeply, um, in with um in with more complexity, um the um the the kind of engagement. And could I add to that as well? So I think just as a sneak pre preview of the next issue, I think Richard Fox Young says in his article at one point that in some ways, and he's engaging with Lamine Senna here, he says in some ways, translation was smoother theologically than in practice it was culturally. And I think that also alludes, uh, relates to some of the questions that the first person asked, which is that, you know, it was often at times in matters like dress and clothing and how people behaved assumptions about gender relations and how husbands and wives should relate to each other, all these kinds of things, where missionaries often imposed their own views on how things should work. And the question is now for scholars revisiting this through the lens of indigenization. Um, how can we account for the cultural bumps in the road that occurred in the process of translation of the spread of, of Christian religion, but that entailed often these cultural, um, you know, the pothole road, I think actually Dalfred used that term uh, to, to, to indigenization. Um, and so the question is, and this also relates to what Deanna Womack raised, how do we looking back treat respectfully the cultural traditions of other peoples, some of whom became Christian and some of whom did not. And how do we now account for it based on what we know and how it looks for us? And I think it ties into some of these issues that we're discussing, discussing about missionary outlooks, cultures of race and uh, social hierarchies of the past. Yeah, and I would, I would simply add, um, who helps me here most in some ways is Leslie Newbegin, um, because it, he talks about in order to embed the gospel within a culture, in order, you know, for it to become indigenous in a culture, there are really three, three legs of the stool here that's necessary. And one is having the scriptures um, in the mother tongue, in the, in the heart language of the people. And so here's where missionaries, and as Lamansani rightly picks up on, you know, really did a good deed, uh, often unwittingly, not realizing they're preserving the very culture sometimes they were working against. So having having the indigenous language there, um, you know, the first Bible that was ever translated here in on this continent was in Algonquin. You know, John Eliot uh, translated while he was pastoring a church full time you know, the, the gospel into um, the local Massachusetts dialect. And so, um, you know, having the, the, the scriptures in the language of the people is one, is, is one leg of the stool. The second leg of the stool is having uh, the indigenous community, the indigenous leadership uh, has to be the ones that, that speak into the translation process, like Ishwari Das, um, you know, and, and the ones that we've named in these other articles, you know, the indigenous church knows the culture like, uh, unlike the missionary, you know, in ways the missionary never could. So you need that, that voice. And, and the third part of the stool to keep it from falling over is the global church is, is the, is the church universal. And that's, you know, the church historic, as well as, you know, the, the, the universal global church. And, and so in the past, um, you know, oftentimes mission stood more solidly on the missionary, uh, the, the global church interpretation, leaving out often the local. And, and, there are, and, and you do that and the stool falls over. Um, but you go the other way and, and you, you, you have only the indigenous church and the gospel and, and you lose touch with the global community and you can fall over the other way. You know? so, so you really need all three of these. And I think that, um, you know, in terms of indigenization, uh, you know, we've, we've gone far one way 
we, we were coming back, we're, we're recognizing more and more that, that, you know, 19th century and earlier mission focused too much on the missionary and not enough on in indigenous populations and going forward, um, you know, we have, we're in the process of trying to make sure that that voice um, is, is dominant, is, 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 is recognized. And, and so I think that in terms of native communities, you know, this has been the real struggle to lift up the native voices and, and one of the difficulties in native communities is that the elders, many of the elders in these communities were trained by the missionaries they still remember and remember in many cases very fondly. And so, you know, they're holding on to the things that the, you know, against the younger population that's saying, wait a minute, you know, uh, why, why did they toss that, you know, it's like, so, so this is a part of some of the tensions uh, that are going on in native communities. And I think we'll continue uh, and, and, um, but that's part of this process of indigenization and, and recognizing that we need to be the global church together. Um, we need to hear all these voices. So anything we can do to lift up voices long silenced as our Presbyterian creed um, uh, of uh, 1967 says, you know, we need to lift those voices up. Um, but in the larger community, and this is where world Christianity, I think, has such opportunity um, to, to address these issues. Uh, just one very quick question for Bonnie, Sue, is that, could you um, reference the name, the title of that DOS book again for one of our listeners who is curious? The name of the DOS article that Arun oh, Jones yeah. did. Yeah, the uh, name of the article that's in the um, in this issue that just came out is Refusing to Translate Ishwari DOS in the Indigenization of Western Christianity in 19th Century North India. Okay. Maybe we can send that via email later too, because that was a quite a long title. <laughs> Um, and I have the questioner's email. Um, I think maybe we're getting close to time, but um, we did have a question from somebody wondering if you thought, you all thought that the Presbyterian polity was particularly conducive to indigenization. For example, uh, the issue of shared power and vote emerged quite early in um, this person, Thomas Nimick's study of the mission in Ningbo, China. The argument for full membership and vote prevailed because that was consistent with Presbyterian polity. Well, I mean, every place may be slightly different, but I can say based on my own research in Egypt um, that the American Presbyterians there who belonged to the United Presbyterian Church of North America at the time were very active in encouraging um, autonomy among Egyptians in the church. And they actually wrote a constitution in, and I've been meaning to write an article about it. I think they did it in 1870 and it became a model that the Coptic Orthodox church, which was the major Christian Orthodox church of Egypt ended up copying years later. And, um, and it also became arguably a model for a kind of consultative government um, among Egyptians at large. So, I mean, we can see that there. Um, and I, I think the patterns, you can also see that through the articles in this, um, in this collection, that there were places where, um, you know, indigenous leaders were leading congregations from the mid 19th century onward. So there's, it wasn't, and this also goes back to something Connie said, it was a really messy process. You mentioned that with regard to China and the medical work that the Chinese women had a lot of autonomy over some of the institutions and that that only ended in the mid 20th century. So it wasn't even linear. That's another thing that complicates the story, right? And it could change according to personalities and also polities from home to, uh, churches from the mission sending front back in the United States just echo what Heather said and just to kind of maybe challenge or 
push back a little bit. I know that Ryan Dunch has said in his very important work, he actually argues that the Methodist power structure was the, almost the best for, for, for indigenization that they had, they had but, but, and I think, but I don't know if there was any, I, and I think you could probably argue about that back and forth, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's any kind of definitive way to prove, you know, which was the you know, actual, you know, best, um, best power structure. Um, but I think, um, to what had to just echo what Heather said, I think individual personalities probably had a lot to do with it more than in, uh, more more than the structure. I mean, there there probably are stru some structures that are more in, inimical or make made it harder to do this. But I think for a lot of the mainline Protestant churches, what I found is like there might be a particular missionary or a particular like set of people that 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 made the transfer of power more e e e you know easier, and then and then a set of power that made it different. Um, you know, but but maybe maybe you could argue that. I mean, I'd, I'd have to to be honest with you. If I saw that as a as an argument an essay, I'd be I'd start out skeptical and I'd have to be convinced. <laughs> but it's a great question. Thank you for that great question. Well, also Connie, your question the the Dunch scenario in China. He's referring to a place where there were multiple Protestant missions active. Yeah, and you know, in like the places where I'm studying, the Presbyterians were the main show in town, besides the Roman Catholics, and they didn't even talk to one another and they pretended that they didn't exist for yeah. decades until right before the Second Vatican Council. So I mean, it really can vary so much from one place to another, whether there's even another Protestant organization to compare oneself with. That's very true, and that's actually what it's so difficult to put Catholicism in 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 the mix when you're doing missionaries because it was such a different thing, and there was there was that tendency to even when they were in the same town to to pretend that each other didn't exist too. So I think that that's another really great point. So we're at three o two. I don't know if you guys have time for another question or two or. Should we do one and then kind of wrap it up from there? Do I have a, um, okay. So this is um, a question from Betsy Stephanie. She says, I'm studying my grandfather BC Milliken's collection with your assistance through his collection of photos that he took and his materials that he brought home to translate to the home audience. So he was a missionary to Thailand. Um, I'm very grateful to have this research focus. Um, his report from Thailand was not received well, and his photography with interactive items from his travels was kept in the family. So she wants to know, is there a suggested model of sharing these types of materials to share the efforts to translate the, to the current interests of, you know, or to translate to the interests of people today? And so that maybe is a question for the yeah. I'm sorry, Heather, please. Yeah, I have two thoughts. One is I participated in a PHS live event before, and I have a feeling that a lot of audience members are sometimes curious, and Nancy, you can speak to this, about what people do if they have materials, family materials, that they might like to donate. So that's one thing, and maybe you can speak to that. The other thing is, in general, I've become only myself more aware, aware recently of the power of posting things to um, places like Wikimedia Commons with illustrative captions, where if you're willing to release your to release possible copyright on images that you own the rights to, you can make them broadly accessible to a wider public. But then the then it's tricky. You want to make sure you give uh, useful information so that people can use it constructively. But I think really, Nancy, that's something maybe you could tell people about. Yes. Um receiving materials that have been passed along in families is one of the key ways that we build a rich collection here at PHS. Um, you know, we, we tend to get sooner rather than later the official records of the church um, or the mission. And some of the papers that are held in families take longer to come to the archives, but it having those different perspectives and a lot of times different kinds of sources, um, different formats, different ways of reflecting on what is happening um, is really important. And so um, please reach out to us. Um, you can reach out to me directly, um, Nancy Taylor, or to um, our reference email and I or someone else will get back to you and talk to you about making a donation of materials to PHS. I was just going to put, um, if I can get myself together, put your email in the um, Thank you. <laughs> in the chat for folks. 
Mm. And then also uh, I'll put a second email, which is David Stan Yunus, our records archivist who can receive materials as well. So those are two good people to contact if you have questions or items that you want to send to us. Um, so thank you guys. That was really great questions. If we didn't get to everybody, um, we're recording this and we will have a transcript of the chat. So I can certainly share some of these questions with the panelists um, after the fact. Um, and we have your- Just, I, I yeah, know we need please. to- um, go, but I, I thought it was. Um, in, I saw one of the questions um, about, about the about about the about the, the Thai Christians, and they mm -hmm. said, um, "Can you speak to the indigenous uh, issue? The indigenous is more than just the transfer of power." And I think it's of yeah. time. I can't quite, but I wanted to actually point out that Dolphred had actually a really great line in his. Um, it reminded me of of this that he said. Um, he said, "Indigenization is more than the transfer of power, but it's truly not less than that." Um, so I guess, and so I guess a lot of the um, the focus of this issue, you're right, has been on the issue of the individual transfer of power, and then the issue of about the, the broader society. That's kind of a whole other question, um, which which, which um, I've actually kind of thought of an answer, but I'm not going to. You know, we, we I, I think people want to be released, so I'm not going to give it now. But I, I, I do I, I do want to just call your attention to that great line by Dolphred, if, you, if you'd like to read the article. Yeah, and I see we won't have time to answer all the questions, perhaps, but there's also a question about Rufus Anderson and the ABCFM. And that's another question that points to differences among Presbyterians and that there were more than one, there was more than one Presbyterian organization sending missions, and they had different uh, policies and, and so forth. So the ABCFM were not in Egypt. Um, and in Egypt, they did emphasize autonomy more within the, the churches. So but we're, relative to say Le what's now Lebanon. So you can see that as well, very, um, you know, striking differences, variations from one place to another. Any other closing comments? I don't want to cut you guys off, but I also know, like you said, um, folks may, we may be losing some folks just because they have somewhere to be. Um, so again, if we couldn't get your question, we have your contact information from the way you signed up for the um, webinar so we can try to get an answer to you offline. Um, if you have follow-up questions, you can always contact PHS reference at refdesk at history.pcusa.org. I will put that in the chat. I think, by the way, Gabriella, one thing that's clear is that um, Bonnie, Sue, Connie, and I uh, have been energized putting these two issues together, partly because there's just so much to say. And you can even see that in the deep questions that people are yeah. asking in the chat. This is a really important subject. And these two issues have not exhausted it. They're barely scratching the surface because there's a lot to say about how these processes occurred and what the consequences are. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a great sort of closing but starting point too. <laughs> I want to thank all of the folks on the panel for joining us and the audience and just say that we are floating the idea of potentially having another PHS Live opportunity um, later in the year that would focus a bit more on the second special issue, but I think give folks a chance again to kind of revisit the larger issues that we've raised today. Um, so again, thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriella, for handling the questions. And um, everyone who registered will get a follow-up email. Um, so with a link to the recording and again, contact information and other things. So, uh, and we would be very happy to follow up with any of you all. Okay, thank you all very much. Thanks for joining us. And we hope to see you again at um, a future PHS Live. We'll be doing one, what are we in June? So that we've got another one coming up in July and they are listed on our PHS website. I can't remember off the top of my head what July is. I know, I know it, but uh, you can check our website. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Bye.